and our final speaker of this section is, uh, is Barbara, Koen Barbara Koenig. Uh, she's professor uh, of the Institute uh, for Health and Aging, and uh, she also directs the UCSF uh, Bioethics Program. Uh, good afternoon. I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to be part of this. I'm very aware that I'm the last speaker in a very long day, so I'm going to try and uh, move uh, a bit quickly. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the California End of Life Option Act and do some reflecting on how we've prepared for and responded to legalization uh, in California. Uh, so that's my task. Um, so the history, for those of you who don't recall, is that uh, Jerry Brown signed the, the, the EOLOA, as we call it, on October 5th, 2015. And then it went into effect. We didn't know when it was going to go into effect, but it ended up going into effect June 9th, 2016. This was relatively unexpected for those of us who had not been really involved in the situation. It passed quite quickly because of the the, <clears throat> the actions of a very influential assemblywoman, Susan Eggman, who's a hospice social worker uh, and was very persuasive and really turned the legislature around. Um, so I'm going to say, from my position as the director of bioethics at UCSF, I experienced this as really a bioethics emergency because suddenly, uh, in, in a very short period of time, possibly as much as a couple months, uh, institutions all around the state were going to have to have practices and procedures in place. And if there's a take-home message I want to give you from my talk, it's that this isn't as easy as it seems. It seems like it should be fairly straightforward to go from a simple law to, legal, to practice, but it's actually not the case uh, for many reasons. Um, so to, to respond to this uh, uh, what I felt as an emergency. Um, we went to several foundations, I'll name them later, um, and we uh, decided that it was important to convene key stakeholders from around the state, so we held a series of two meetings. The first in December of 2015, which was really to get ethics committees, palliative care programs, and others to talk about how, what, what kind of internal processes they, they would each have as they set up their own policies to go into effect the next year. And then to, to evaluate where we were after a year, we had another meeting uh, convening in September of 2017 in Sacramento. Um, this project has yielded some, uh, hopefully, some shared resources. Uh, there is a project website, you have the link here, uh, which also has uh, videos of all of the key plenaries at those different sessions, which might be useful for those of you who are um, interested in getting more in depth about some of these issues. Uh, we also wrote up a, a paper summarizing the December 15th convening uh, with talking about some of our lessons uh, for California, and that was published in the American Journal of Public Health. Um, so basically the activities that we've engaged in are three, um, the, the convening and then figuring out resource sharing, um, a survey of California healthcare systems which is ongoing, so I don't have results to share with you now. Neil Wenger is involved in that. I guess the one thing I would say, Neil, uh, early on is that um, <clears throat> Even though many, in some institutions in California have made policies, there are still a lot that have not. Uh, and after a year, there were, many, there were many institutions that really had not dealt with this. So just to make that, especially in rural areas. Um, uh, we also have had a separate project. We wanted to get sort of a range of, at the policy level, down to the on the ground experience. And you heard earlier from Helene Starks, uh, some of our project, which was to collect uh, patient narratives that were from different voices, the patient, the, the provider, and the family. Um, but I want to pick up on Dan Sulmazy's uh, discussions this morning about how complicated this is and the sort of sense of moral ambivalence that this topic brings to many of us. Um, and <clears throat> this implementation, uh, this idea of even talking about this when we started planning that first conference in December, using the word implementation was so uh, distressful and unpleasant for some people in our working group that we had constant uh, uh, 
uh, sessions talking about how to deal with this. So this is an issue, and I just, I guess, I want to make the the argument and that this that these moral concerns are not simply that will not something that will simply go away and disappear. Um, and if they do, I think we would we should have some concern, which doesn't mean I'm someone who had not been an, an advocate of legalization, but for maybe a little bit more like Joanne Lynn, I, I wasn't necessarily opposed to, in many cases, physicians and others being involved in, in managing and orchestrating midwifing death, because I think that's very important. Um, but, but nonetheless, I have some concerns about routinization. I'll come back to that at the end. So there are many different ways in which I think as we watched this process of stakeholders getting together and talking in California, there were again people when we did our, even in our Sacramento meeting, the second meeting, there were many people who expressed concern staying in the room all day and listening to the conversation. So this is, I think, going to remain. Uh, and it's some, some moral intuitions that I think are important. Um, there also is, has been real ambivalence on the part of many of the institutions in California that have responded. Even those who are offering the, the, um, the act and, and making it possible have not necessarily endorsed it from an institutional perspective. And so that ambivalence is almost built in. Um, there's also the, on, the concern about being the go-to physician or institution for this. I think that's been the case for many uh, palliative care programs. Okay, so what are some of the other, um, so when people, when an institution decides how to respond to a, a law change, such as the one uh, that happened in California, um, there are a number of things that you have to think about, and this is not even a comprehensive list, but you have to address all kinds of issues. Do you allow ingestion of drugs on premises, for example? And that's not as easy as you think. Most hospitals say no, but if you're something like Laguna Honda Hospital in San Francisco, which is a giant long-term care hospital with a license, how do those, those patients don't have any other access because this is where they live. So where would they go? Out on the street? Um, uh, there's the issue of mental health evaluations. Some hospitals, my own institution, UCSF, has mandated, uh, has mandated mental health evaluations for everyone. That has created uh, a lot of animosity on the part of some individuals. Um, again, palliative care involvement, I've noticed most people agree, of course, that you have, that's the baseline, that you need to make sure that people are getting good care. Um, some institutions, I believe, and David Magnus, correct me if I'm wrong, but that uh, Stanford, for example, um, requires uh, some kind of ethics consultation. Um, and uh, so that's uh, uh, another, some might see that as a burden, some extra layer of oversight. And then there's also the issue of who on the staff or will participate. And it turns out that that is not a simple yes, no. I mean, people thought it was going to be, we just figure out who's willing, who's not willing. It's turned out to be deeply contextual and quite uh, complicated. And even if you survey everybody, OK, what does it mean that you have five neonatologists sitting over there who say that they would be willing to do this? Uh, probably not very relevant to most of the kinds of cases that we get. Um, so sometimes people are more willing if it's their own patient or less willing. It's not at all clear. Um, and then we also have the, uh, the complicated issues of how exactly to honor conscientious objection uh, while, uh, while respecting patient choice. Uh, and that can, can be difficult. What if an entire department or division, for example, of oncologists in your institution is not willing to participate? Okay, um, so, so in general, I think implementation has been tough and uneven. Um, it, re it also, the other thing that we've learned in our d several convenings is that it really requires significant resources, including clearly identified patient navigators. And if you don't have that in place, it doesn't really work very well or very smoothly. Um, it's only easily practicable when built on a good hospice and palliative care program. And that's, I think, one of Neil, uh, Neil Wenger's conclusion from some of our, our, our shared work, uh, which is that this doesn't happen very easily in places that don't have that infrastructure in place already. So that's a, perhaps an interesting lesson. Um, and then finally, I've already mentioned that physicians' willingness to prescribe is not a, a simple yes, no. 
Um, also, uh, the other reason that we're following this with great interest in, at UCSF and across all of uh, California is because our law was implemented with a sunset clause, which means it will sunset on January 1st, 2026. And so we are, we feel it's incumbent on us to start right now to think about what would help us uh, decide whether it should be continue, what is the appropriate data, et cetera. So we're really thinking about that. And notice I keep putting implementation uh, in quotes because of I, I know the sensitivities of my colleagues. Um, there's another feature of our law that's something we hope to really look at, which is that as an extra um, as an extra guarantee about voluntariness, our law at the last minute had added something called a final attestation, meaning that theoretically patients are supposed to sign something to indicate that they are uh, that they are taking this drug when they act, before they actually do it, uh, as opposed to when they get the prescription. We, we don't really know what's happening with those forms because the data collection is not yet fully adequate to know whether those whether that's actually at working, um, whether those data are actually being returned um, to the state. So stay tuned for that. Um, there's also a, an interesting issue that came up in our stakeholder in, uh, second stakeholder engagement meeting, and that has to do with the role of interpreters. And interpreters were actually um, being asked to sign documentation that essentially was uh, uh, ascertaining the, um, uh, the voluntariness of the action, which of course is way out of their scope. Uh, and so that created a lot of problems and potentially some barriers and the, the State Interpreter Association was, real, was working to deal with that. Um, so the, the Department of Public Health collects the data. Um, we think there, we want to join in the data discussion tomorrow, but just to bring that up now, uh, all of the data that's collected was not released, so we think that's really important that, that they release the data to researchers. Um, there's a need for additional common data elements, and we're going to come back to that. Matt Winnie is going to talk about that. And then an issue that's one of my uh, sort of pet peeves because of my history as a medical anthropologist trying to study over three decades the issue of, of how end-of-life care practices and bioethics serve or don't serve patients from a diverse background. Um, I'm really interested because of the issue of uh, 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 diverse populations in California um, how we capture that information in the way we report the law. And it turns out that we don't uh, at all. The, that information is being just taken from the death certificate, which is, according to my colleagues who work on this in the CD, CDC, the absolute worst way uh, to capture that information. And there's no uh, self-report of any kind. So those are some important issues. Um, so the, the best practices that we need to think about are the impact on diverse populations. Um, and research thus far suggests, I missed the end of the sentence here, that, that a fair amount of social and cultural capital is required to navigate your way through this system. And whether that's a, uh, a, a, uh, something that m perhaps patients without that social capital are protected from being to, exposed to this, that would be another way to think about it. Um, there also are issues of waiting periods and what constitutes a request that the qualitative data have revealed. Often patients think they've made a request, but it hasn't somehow gotten into the system. Um, uh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to, uh, I just want to end since I'm now, let's see, at my one minute. Um, uh, talk about, I want to end by what I think are the most important next steps in research. Um, and it's slightly different than I think some of the lists that we've talked about so far. Um, and so I think that the symbolic impact of the End of Life Option Act, having it, just having it out there as an option is really something that we need to start studying. How will that affect end of life care and palliative care generally for the multitudes of people who are not going to take it up? Um, I think we need to focus really hard on the consequences of the, for, of the healing role. Um, and we need to start thinking now about the impact of routinization. Because um, I think many of us who've done end of life decision making for years know it, there's some ways in which these things need to hurt a little bit. Um, so I think we need to think about that. And that moves into the issue of mandated disclosure of end of life options or how this is going to affect advanced care planning. And Mara talked about that earlier. Um, we also have 
um, have, it was raised today, the issue of consumer-driven health care. Is this, is this need for physician aid in dying part of a broader set of issues of lack of trust? Tony mentioned that. Other people have as well. Um, and then finally, um, some of my other recent work has been to try and figure out how to move some of these discussions out of individual uh, patient-doctor communication and figure out how to do this with a genuine democratic uh, public engagement. So I would like to take up that challenge. Uh, I think that was Dan's challenge as well, because I think that's really, uh, that's important. So th let me thank our team. You saw this slide before, but it's been a team of people from around California uh, and one person from Washington doing this work. Um, and we were sponsored by the California Healthcare Foundation and the Stupsky Foundation. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to the conversation.